So, um, welcome to Chapter 18 for Bio 212, um, Norwalk Community College. And I would like to begin by reminding you of some of the material we covered back in AMP1. Back in AMP1, we covered, we introduced this idea that there were 11 organ systems that have to function, they have to be regulated in such a way that they're all working together. And one obvious thing to think about is how does the nervous system do this? And particularly chapter 15, how does the sympathetic and parasympathetic arms of the autonomic nervous system together with the enteric nervous system regulate at a nervous system level what's going on inside the body? And what chapter 18 is going to do is introduce this idea that cells can make materials and those materials can be deposited into the circulatory system. And once inside the circulatory system, they will travel everywhere that the fluid that makes up of the circulatory system travels to. And in doing so, the consequence on the whole is a mixture of both nervous system and endocrine responsibilities that allow for the regulation of the total human body. Some things to pay attention to as you're going through here is that even though we introduce the endocrine system inside chapter 18 as though this is what happens inside the body, obviously every human being has their own set of characteristics, but the most obvious differences, of course, is half the population is female and the other half is male. So even though inside chapter 18 we introduce some of those basic differences, remember it'll be chapters 28 and 29 that fully develop how the endocrine responsibilities are unique for males and unique for females. But having said all that, let's get to work. What you actually have in this figure here, of course, is the reintroduction of our nervous system that utilizes neurotransmitters, okay, and those neurotransmitters from AMP1, if you think about that, those could be acetylcholine, ACH, it could be norepinephrine, whoops, put an E there epinephrine, API, okay, and then beyond that, you know, there are a series of neurotransmitters we asked you to learn, but we haven't seen them, in case you hadn't noticed that. We haven't seen them since their introduction. How does that sound? What is important to remember, though, is that these three neurotransmitters we will see throughout AMP2, they create faster response or responses with briefer effects that, that act on specific targets that have the receptors, the cholinergic or adrenergic receptors, receptors, tors, to the NTs, neurotransmitters. Okay? So the general idea is in place. How the endocrine system works is we're going to make something that is similar to a neurotransmitter, and we're going to call it a hormone. And that hormone, like everything else in biology, has a specific three-dimensional shape and it's going to be characterized by that shape into three subgroups or types of hormones. We'll worry about that a little bit later. It's to be made in one location, released in one part of the body, and it regulates activity of cells in other parts of the body. It could also regulate its own self. Okay. The point here is though is this. You actually now have a mechanism that will create slower responses. Whoops, that wasn't what was supposed to happen there. Okay, the effects last longer, and you actually have a broader influence, meaning you can target multiple cells that are expressing the receptors to those hormones, and we're going to have what we're going to call pleiotropic effects. So let's remind ourselves that there are two different types of glands inside the body, right? And there are exocrine glands which are ducted, and if you think about say your tear ducts, or if you think about the pancreas, materials be made, they're transported inside of a duct to a specific location. Endocrine glands are ductless, which means it, it's going to secrete its products into the interstitial fluid around the cell that's making it, and that will then diffuse into the blood. Now let's make sure you understand what that means. Remember, if we have something like this, and this is a, a representation of the capillary beds you're going to find inside your body. 
and between capillary beds we have cells and those cells let's put like this put a cell here I'm gonna put a cell inside this space here I'm gonna put a cell in this space over here and let's just say they secrete hormone a hormone like it's supposed to be an A, but I put an X. Sorry about that. A. Per apple. Will diffuse into the interstitial fluid and then ultimately into the circulatory system. Remember, it's always going to move down its what? Its concentration gradient. So if that's the way it's going to work, what Mother Nature did is she took a series of endocrine glands, placed them in the pituitary, the thyroid, the parathyroid, the adrenal, that and pineal glands these are the ones we introduce first because these are the big obvious structures as you go through anatomy and physiology too you're going to learn that essentially every tissue inside the body is an endocrine gland the specialization as a result of differentiation of cells and therefore their tissues requires a different set of hormones to regulate either that location of the body or some distant location of the body okay so how does it all work well let's get rid of the cartoon whack let's go here hormones affect only specific target tissues with specific receptors okay so and obviously those receptors can change their number on the cell surface so when you're reading inside the textbook and they start talking about about down regulation and up regulation what they're talking about is if there is too much signaling coming in if too much then reduce the numbers and by numbers I mean reduce the numbers of receptors and so if you've reduced the number then you can understand that if there are no receptors on the cell if too little or too few, if too few, then increase number. And by number, I mean number of receptors. So at the end of the day, essentially, look what you're doing. Everything we learned way back in AMP1, increasing and decreasing number of receptors on the surface of the cell. Now you can begin to understand how the endocrine system can begin to regulate normal homeostasis, where what you're looking at here is the upper and lower bounded ranges of the receptors on the surface of a cell over time. Cool. Well, let's get rid of that. Let's get into the next one. How do these actually work? Well, I told you a moment ago that you can actually have an endocrine cell make a hormone, exocytosis, it's collected into the circulatory system, whereby diffusion and affinity, affinity, the Neuro, in this case, the hormone will bind to the receptor and you'll actually have some distant target cell regulating it. You can have cells that are adjacent to one another, though. We call these paracrine type signalings. They act on neighboring cells. The paracrine cell uses simply the interstitial fluid between the cells to transport the hormone to bind to the receptors on the nearby target cell. And then in some cells, you actually can have this autocrine signaling mechanism where the cell makes its own hormone to then regulate its own activity. What's most important here is to understand is that local hormones act by either a paracrine system or an autocrine system. And off the top of my head, I can't think of one that is both, but I'm sure if I looked something up, we could find out that they're actually shared systems. This is where things start to get a little bit more complex because we have to now classify the hormones that are being made inside the body. And the significance of this is you're going to see that it comes down to two real basic classifications. They are either water soluble or they are lipid soluble. Okay, And the water soluble ones are steroid hormones and steroid hormones are all made from cholesterol. Thyroid hormones are going to be made inside the thyroid. You're going to see that they are made from amino acids. And nitric oxide, you can remember back from AMP1, is an amino acid, L-arginine, and that's converted into a gas, okay, by nitric, nitric oxide synthase. 
and OS. Okay. So remember, nitric oxide was a neurotransmitter back in AMP1. Now we're thinking about it in terms of a hormone, and that hormone is lipid soluble. And the significance here, of course, is this lipid soluble gas passes directly through, directly through the cell membrane. Likewise, thyroid hormone can pass directly through the membrane. Steroid hormone can pass directly through the membrane. What they can't do is they can't stay soluble inside the plasma of blood. So they all need a transport protein. Water soluble hormones, on the other hand, are free inside the circulatory system. These could be amine hormones. Those could be your NEs, etc. Peptide protein hormones, if you think about say the larger, if you think about any amino acid that could be put inside the circulatory system that can stay soluble, okay, that's exactly what they're talking about here. And then there are these things that are called eicosanoids. And these are special because they're all made from arachidonic acid, arachidonic acid, okay, which is a 20 carbon structure that a whole family of water, water soluble inflammatory response hormones are made from. How do they work? Mechanism of hormone action. Response depends on both the hormone and the target cell. Lipid soluble hormones will bind to receptors inside the cell. Usually, if they're not inside the cytosol, they're inside the nucleus of the cell. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Water soluble hormones bind receptors at the plasma membrane. Your textbook teaches you the second messenger system stuff. It was originally discovered this way, and you'll see. Ultimately, Mother Nature has a whole series of systems. What did I just do? But depending on how far you go in biology, but what I want you to do is make sure you understand that at the end of the day, you've amplified a small signal that arrived in the shape of a hormone at the surface of the cell. The responsiveness in the target cell depends on that hormone's concentration, the abundance of the cell receptors, and the actual influence that's being exerted by other hormones. So there's an entire conversation that's happening at the cell surface and inside the cell, depending on what other hormones are actually present in binding receptors as well. So let's draw that out for you. Put a cell here, cell nucleus, and I'm going to put a receptor that looks like this on the surface of the cell, and I'll put a receptor that looks like that on the surface of the cell and I'm going to put a receptor that looks like this on the surface of the cell and I'm going to change colors here I'm going to go red so imagine red can only fit in this space right here let's imagine green can only fit in this space right here and that oh let's go I don't know yellow can only fit in this space right here. Now notice what I've done is I've made a shape that confers to each of the shapes of the receptors. That's allosteric, allosteric regulation. But, I mean, essentially, shape denotes function in biology. Now, in this example, we could have a hormone that is permissive. This green one would be synergistic, and the yellow one would be antagonistic. So in this case, these two are working together and this one is working against whatever those signals are. So if we go back to here and say these guys are amplifying a signal traveling inward, imagine if you will the signal that's actually coming in through this part here is figuring out a way to actually slow down that signal. Okay, So that's what we mean when we say hormones can exert influence as a result of the types of hormones that are present. Okay, let's take a look at how your textbook wants you to think about all of this. And what you're looking at here is, they call it a free hormone. Um, this is actually the demonstration of a steroid hormone in green utilizing a transport protein that was either made at the cytosynthesis of the hormone or made inside the liver. And as it approaches the target cell, affinity causes the release from the transport protein. It diffuses through the plasma membrane because it's lipid soluble. It then travels to the nucleus where there's a receptor for that hormone. 
And what it does is it drives transcription and translation. I wonder why they put this like alters gene expression. Well, remember, it's transcription and translation. So you're going to make mRNA. And that mRNA is going to cause a protein to be made. And remember, we small subunit, large subunit. We make our primary chain of amino acids here. But the reality is, is now what you've done is you've changed the cell's activity. This takes some time. Okay? It's not instantaneous. But the whole point is going to be this. Think about what happened. How did it work? Hormone was made in location A, used to transport protein made there or someplace else, and then transported itself through the circulatory system to whatever that target cell needed to do. If we're thinking about how water-soluble hormones work, what happens here, I know this looks a little bit more intricate, but in reality, the first messenger, the hormone, binds to the receptor here. And what Mother Nature did is she made a series of complex proteins inside the cytosol of the cell, regulated through this thing that's called a G protein. And what's going to happen is it activates an enzyme, and that enzyme is called adenylate cyclase. And it takes ATP and converts it into cyclic AMP. The shape change turns this into a messenger. Okay, And what's going to happen is protein kinases are going to become activated. A protein kinase is something like a cytosolic engine that's waiting for a key to turn it on. And that's what's actually happening here. It's going to phosphorylate it. And that change in phosphorylation causes millions and millions of physiologic responses as a result of the change in the energy state inside of that cell. What you need to walk away from this slide understanding is that we have to shut this off somehow. And phosphodiesterases inactivate that cyclic AMP. So if you inactivate the cyclic AMP, all of this stops. And this is only one example of many, many different types of water-soluble hormones that can actually cause a signal inside the cell. But before we move on to the next slide, what I want to make sure you understand is I've shown you two basic types. One is lipid-soluble, the other is water-soluble. Water-soluble hormones bind the receptors at the cell surface, whereas our hormone here is lipid-soluble. It can pass through that membrane and therefore go directly to wherever that receptor is going to be. Cool. So if these are the things that are happening, most hormonal regulation is by negative feedback. There are very few examples of positive feedback systems that utilize this. The whole point, of course, is that if we're thinking about, whoops, how did I get way the hell down there? Okay, if we're thinking about how this all works, remember, feedback systems look a lot like this, right? And this is normal homeostasis. So depending upon either the presence of the hormone or the presence of the receptor, let's imagine the receptors here first and this dotted line is the presence of the hormone. You can see what's going to happen with time. Okay. What I'm doing is I'm drawing for you a line here that if, here the, if the receptor's present first and the hormone comes along, well, you've now down-regulated the receptor. Okay. And the receptor doesn't have to be at the cell surface. It could be inside that nucleus right there. Okay. Cool. This is a pretty good place to take a break. We're only nine slides in, but we're 18 minutes in. So I'm going to stop this, and we're going to come back, and we're going to think about the stress response. How does the body actually respond to signals? And we spend a lot of time thinking about stress, but people need to understand that stress is nothing more than signaling inside of the body and how you respond to signals from coming from outside of the body and inside. Okay, we'll be back in a second.